Good evening. Before we get started, we'd like to make a few announcements. Bathrooms are located in the hallway to the left as you leave the auditorium. You are passing on your way in. The emergency exits for the auditorium are the same as the entrance door. One at the top of the auditorium and one off the stage. For security purposes, the doors to the school will be locked at 7 p.m. The sign is posted at the main entrance with the number to call or text for admission. If you haven't already, please sign the white attendance sheet on the table outside the auditorium. The meeting is being recorded via Zoom. Please note that the chat feature will not be monitored. Public comment will only be accepted in person. A link to the video will be posted to the website next week. Uh, this is a business meeting. For it asks your cooperation to maintain quorum. Please be considerate and refrain from interrupting board members and other speakers. Now I'd like to call to order the August 18th, 2022 Committee to Hold a regular board meeting at 6.02 p.m. Roll call, please. Commissioner Archambeau. Here. Commissioner Lawson. Here. Commissioner Rath. Here. Commissioner Root. Here. Commissioner Seaman. Here. Commissioner Cotto. Here. Commissioner James. Here. Are there any changes to the agenda? Hearing none, we'll move on to financials. May I have a motion to approve the July 22, 2022 financials? No move. Second. Discussion, Jim? Uh, thank you, Commissioner James. Um, as of July 31st, our operating surplus is $947,767, slightly lower than last month because we are starting to see the effects of the delay of the Cook County tax disbursement. Uh, we were expecting to receive one half of the second installment in July, another half of the second installment in August. As you know, uh, neither one of those installments will be arriving until December or January. Fortunately, our operating expenses and our operating capital are uh, low goal budgets. Instead, we're also working to do the reimbursement from the capital funds or operating dollars we spent on Boy Beach. Uh, and other capital projects. So we are we're getting close to a million dollars back from those uh, operating expenses. And that will help offset the delay in reducing taxes. Um, as industry can run up, we started to turn off some of our money. I will give you a more complete report on that uh, in September. Uh, and we're going to finish with that project. Thank you. Awesome. Any questions for Jim? If you look at our operating surplus, our operating surplus a million, almost a million bucks above budget. That's even with a million dollar shortfall in tax receipts from Cook County. So it's been a great year. Um, despite all these challenges we had, congratulations to the Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, the team. All right, if there are no further questions or comments, roll call, please. Commissioner Lawson? Yes. Commissioner Rapp? Yes. Commissioner Root? Yes. Commissioner Seaman? Yes. Commissioner Cotto? Yes. Commissioner Archambault? Yes. Commissioner James? Yes. All right, moving on to vouchers. They have a motion to approve the vouchers for a total of $1,064,387.99. As presented. So moved. Okay. Motion and second. Discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, these vouchers have been uh, reviewed by the Commissioner Stephen. Um, they are the ordinary cost of doing business for the current situation. I don't think there's anything questionable or controversial in them. So I respectfully ask for your order of approval. Questions or comments? It's been a full year. It's been a full year, David. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Chief. All right, no further comments. Roll call, please. Commissioner Rapp? Yes. Yeah. Commissioner Roof? Yes. Yeah. 
Commissioner Seaman? Yes. Commissioner Cotto? Yes. Commissioner Archambo? Yes. Commissioner Lesson? Yes. Commissioner Jane? Yes. On the new business, ordinance number 589, dating taxes. May have a motion to approve ordinance number 589, in ordinance to base the tax year two levy for the year 2021, base the principles principle of interest on nine million fifty thousand dollars general obligation park property and alternate revenue source series 2020 of the Winnetka Park District, Cook County, Illinois, as presented. So moved. Second. Motion and second. Discussion. Oh, you want to explain the yes, so um, under the contract with the bond, if the park district has the revenue to pay the interest, we are required to do so. Uh, even with the Cook County tax delay, we will have enough cash reserves to cover the two hundred twenty thousand eight hundred fifty dollars we are required to pay. So uh, under the contract, we are required to pay the same tax we would have collected to make that payment. So we are just complying with the contract that we agreed. We have sufficient resources. We have the taxes that we otherwise would have collected to pay for this. Uh, to pay for this interest. Rate. That's correct. Yes. Great. All right. One, one, one question. So the two hundred twenty thousand dollars that is not currently in our tax revenue budget. Correct. This would have been a would have been paid in addition to the tax revenues that we have budgeted. The, the expenses budgeted in our uh, contract will come to the rest of the revenue. Right, the revenue was not. Any other questions? Hearing none, roll call, please. Commissioner Root? Yes. Commissioner Seaman? Yes. Commissioner Cotto? Yes. Commissioner Archambo? Yes. Commissioner Lawson? Yes. Commissioner Rapp? Yes. Commissioner James? Yes. Mr. Terry? All right, we're going to move on to remarks from visitors. Remarks from visitors is your opportunity to address the board on any issue. To call upon, please step up to the podium, speak clearly in the microphone, and state, state your name. Uh, for the record, uh, you do not need to state your address. Some confusion uh, has been clarified. Only you need to state your name. If you choose to identify your address, that's your choice. You don't need to. Please do not remove the microphone or move the podium. There are all positions that will be tapped for you on video. Keep all comments under three minutes. We are going to strictly enforce that tonight. The meetings have gone on uh, very long, five, five and a half hours. So this is not a question and answer forum. So please do not expect a response or answer from the park board this evening. If you prefer to share your comments in writing, you may use the comments cards which are available near the sign-in sheet. Any park district staff will accept the card to be shared with the board. Who would like to speak first? My name is Randy Woodford. Good seeing you all again. Um, it's been quite a year. Uh, one year ago this month, Winneka dog owners showed up en masse to protest the unannounced elimination of the dog use continuum. By the next meeting in September, details of a land swap agreement that had been negotiated between the park board and a confidential trust named Orchard 2020 began to emerge, including details of the proposed breakwater design that included planter pockets and a lured fence that blocked each access and destroyed panoramic views of the lakefront. In subsequent months, as more details of the land swap agreement emerged, including the name behind the Orchid 2020 Trust, opposition to the agreement and the beachfront design proposal increased and solidified. By spring, Community opposition led to the village trustees withdrawing their support for the breakwater design and the land swap. And the park board's point is application to the Army Corps and the IDNR for design approval. It is crystal clear that while the community may like the idea of unifying the parks, we do not support the swap agreement, nor do we support the park board's current plan for developing elders and tenants. 
So where should we go from here? We need to go back to first principles. Although we vehemently oppose the flood, we strongly support the objectives of the 2030 beachfront plan. Protect the shoreline, restore the flood, improve beachfront amenities, and do this in a cost-effective manner that serves the real needs of the community, not some fever dream of real estate overdevelopment. So, what do we do now? Number one, stop the swap. While we like the idea of a unified park, we hate the swap deal. Too many downstream costs, too many hidden obligations, too much control to a tight billionaire. And we are swapping away the very best part, and your part. Two, fixed and open Elder Lane Beach has been closed for three years. That's not okay. Three, restore the bluffs to Elder Centennial. Repair the gas and the bath to two oaks. Repair the gas and the bath to Elder Beach to protect the bluff. Cut down the overgrown vegetation in both parks to block lake views and replant with native grasses. This can be done right away. Four, no stone breakwaters. They're ugly, expensive, and unnecessary. I need three minutes to wrap it up. I'll wrap it up. The beach is underwater, uh, the Elder Centennial completely underwater in January were naturally and fully restored by June. They do not need to be protected by an extensive artificial barrier in the lake. Five, keep Centennial green. Do not overdevelop. We don't need athletic fields. We don't need more parking. We don't need another active park. The beauty and tranquility of Centennial is unique and must be preserved. Six, keep the dog beach at Centennial. It has broad and deep community support and is used throughout the year. We absolutely do not need another human only beach. Even without elder, our beaches are significantly underutilized. But if you insist, Simply designate Centennial as a human beach where you can swim with your dog. Thank you very much. This is a plan we can begin to execute now at a significantly lower cost with a shorter timeline and completion of the strategy, and which will help the park board regain the support and credibility from the community that it's supposed to serve. Thank you. Thank you. Who would like to speak next, Dr. Andy? Well, we also thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Thank John and John. Can you please state your name? Oh, Jimmy Brown. I'd like to be able to do this. Um, Kim Kaza and John, thank you for being with me. And so thank you for all the SOS. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, I have a lot of copies of my remarks, and I will read some of those perspectives in the whole. But I do want to, um, the first part of my remarks is something called the Declaration of Independence, which is something I hope to um, read to all of you like meeting I missed. But it, inc it incorporates many of the things Randy has said and others have said in the prior meeting. Um, and I think I just want to reiterate the last part of it, which said in the Declaration of Independence, which will hopefully how we can go from this forward, independent input from others. That there would be no concessions to adjacent private landowners, no walls, no blockades, no block beach access, no easements, no untested, unproven elements such as tank boxes, no supersized designs to create additional costs and additional barriers, no vegetation beyond normal landscape removal that would net energy. Um, in looking forward towards next week's meeting, I do have a couple of additional requests. One is that Park district for the needs versus wants analysis for the project of others continuing to factoring in the cost and dollars, environmental impact, utilization, and neighborhood impact. Here are three examples. As Randy related, there is evidence that we need to repair our elders and we need to reopen the beach. It's been closed for two years. Do we need ADA access, or is that an expensive want in terms of dollars and green space? Tower has a well conceived ADA access completely competing with adjacent parking. To achieve ADA access, the Elder Centennial will involve building significant infrastructure and additional parking that will consume more green space to block 
and through the requisite grading to build the wall. Three, we question whether there is a need for another active beach. Are there statistics that indicate the tower and Lloyd are overcrowded? We think not. Since the 2030 plan is built, when that has built two magnificent, expensive active beach funds to tower and Lloyd, both beaches have the benefit of being sheltered by a high bluff, thus creating a significant buffer to the adjacent residential area. The layout also accommodates out-of-site parking for construction and usage. The 2030 plan has been touted by many as a guiding light. While it represents an aspirational concept, it was written in 2016, and there may well be new thinking about each one's design that is worth considering. In the 2030 plan, it is expressly written that the plan is intended to be a living document and respond in a realistic way to changing circumstances. And here we are. With that in mind, I'd like to request the following as we all go forward and go back to the drawing board. Design of each and every the current science and the input from hydrologists, environmental experts, and social engineers. Design a beach that is an expansive view of land and open access to our treasured beach shoreline. Recognize that less can be more, and that an over-engineered plan is anti-nature and works against the village's commitment to protect and bring safety. Create a space that is affordable and doesn't continually put additional tax burdens on the residents for that time. Thank I you. was moved by what Rob Ann talked said in the last meeting that it's worth doing something right rather than what is expedient. The land swap has been problematic since the beginning. The cost is just too high. It already has cost a significant loss of trust in municipal government and will mean a significant loss of beautiful parkland between what is being swapped and what is being destroyed in the highly engineered plan. Thank you, Further, a massive beach renovation at this time promises to burden the residents. We are happy to take your written comments. Right. Them, and it'll be in the record. It's four minutes now. I close by saying, please take a pause and fail to protect our natural resources and embark on a path that's right size for the time, considering usage, finances, and environmental And there's more in the room. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Is this all right? Yeah. Okay. My name is Irene Smith. I have just had canceled my speech. As I look at you tonight, commissioners, I see or I imagine I see a 43 vote in favor of the issue of plan. I'd like to suggest tonight that Winnesca residents do not want any of this. As you know, the 2022 Winnesca Office Questionnaire results came out last week. I'd like to read the pocket summary of the section on the park district. As in 2021, there is a broad community support for continued investment in the lake town, particularly for the benefit of Winnetka residents. The beaches are our crown jewel. However, whereas there was resoundingly positive feedback in 2021, on the transformative work of the Park District at Lloyd Beach, the feedback from the community regarding Elder Centennial can best be described in polite company as, go back and sharpen your pencil. While there is continued support for the Winnetka Waterfront 2030 plan, the community places a premium on shoreline access and views, as well as people over pets. Evidence for this summary came from over 95 negative comments about the wall. I'm going to read you a small, extra small sample. This is where I cut. Here we go. There are no walls on any other beaches. It was horrific that walls were proposed for Elder Centennial. Winnetka is building a wall in the Elder Centennial Beach. This is atrocious. It will block views and access. I am very disappointed that my tax dollars are going toward this. You need to do more to step in and prevent this. No wall in the lake and a park board that listens to all, not just a select few. I am very
very, very disappointed. The village and the Winnetka Park District Board have even considered the demands of the homeowner involved in the Elder Beach Centennial Consolidation. I vehemently oppose the erection of any kind of fence to privatize and restrict public use of any of our beachfronts. Please do not allow this to happen. It would be way better to leave the two beaches separated by the house and keep things the way they are. I could go on, but I cut everything else. Through the Freedom of Information Act, I was able to acquire an email written by Warren James, Christina Cotto, Stephen Adams, John Peterson, and Costa Petula on March 26, 2022. In it, Mr. James says, Three uh, there have been countless hours of discussion, design, and negotiations with stakeholders. What I can assure is that we've kept the public interest forefront in all our deliberations. I'm not so sure that's true. I'd like to believe it. There is one other little bit of information that I could maybe miss. Two Mondays ago, the Wilmette Park District uh, met and withdrew a plan for Langdon Beach and went back to the drawing board. Wilmette resident Dean Lindsay said, I think some of the things I'm seeing and hearing today are going to destroy what we have as a valuable asset, which we don't really respect when I see pods and cement stairs. Will Met Park Board Commissioner Lindsay, Lindsay Anderson says, I believe we absolutely have to preserve and protect the character of our park. And as soon as we start developing and paving, we can never get that back. Thank you. We all get a copy of that short talk. Good. All right. Doesn't it warm your heart to know there's a park district that can step back and do something new? Thank you. Good evening, and thanks for allowing us the opportunity to say thank you for the upgrade in your meeting announcements and schedule and your wait for the record stage. Oh, I'm so sorry. I meant to warn. I'm so sorry. Uh, Susie Schreiber, uh, one of the one with the Um, But thank you very much for providing the um, requested information ahead of time so we could read all 300 and plus one pages of it. It was interesting <laughs> this time read. Um, and based on reading it, I would just like to um, refer to a few things that I have indicated in previous uh, comments to the board under policy and procedure. And I have stated, and very clearly so, that the staff and executive director and the entire board of the Minnesota Park District Commissioners are always supposed to follow the policy and procedure manual of the district, which guides the operations and maintenance of the Minnesota Park District on behalf of the residents of the land. Um, the policy and procedure manual clearly states that Robert's rules and orders are always to be followed. And with that comment, just looking at a, a couple of things, well, about five things in your board packet. Um, there was a thing for a change in the phone community uh, procedure manual that referenced power of public, which I think has been handled things very well at this uh, over the course of the spring and summer, um, how we should properly address, address it. But I would ask that you thoughtfully consider the wording because the public has the right to address all of the commissioners, not just the president. And we've had these discussions way back in the 1980s, and I'm sure they followed occasionally in the 1990s. But make sure the public and procedure manual allows someone speaking to. At, you know, at the podium behind you, that they are speaking to all of the commissions. Um, and I realize that they're going to have to change by the time. Then on the real estate assessments, um, if you're upgrading the policy and procedures manual, you 
as WCP rejected such an offer as character. Further, if such quote unquote last and best arrest and final offer was rejected, then there is clearly no agreement in existence. It thus appears the original land swap agreement is null and void by its terms, unless you are actually suggesting the October 2020 agreement negotiated and signed by WCP exists in perpetuity, despite it never going effective over a two year period. Further, if it were found to be the case that a best and final or last and best offer was rejected, it would only reinforce the notion that there's no agreement in the system. Finally, the notion that anything is confidential about this matter is not valid because the transaction involves the public body and taxpayers' money and other interests. WPD board members have an obligation to clearly disclose those things. It's reasonable for a public body to ask a private citizen for a statement of his or her position to share with the public so the public body can decide whether there is any point in proceeding after engaging public reaction to private individual proposal. The same degree of reciprocity is also true. If WPD cannot provide this clarity, then they should stop negotiation and drop this entire proposal. It seems fairly apparent that WPD is not sufficiently organized and transparent to find the lower than any deal. With that as background, I close three simple questions. One, as the property swap is null and void, all the actions being taken by the WPD are related to an agreement that doesn't exist and seems to be a waste of time. For example, how can WPD find an app, file an application on a contract that is null and void? And why would we be spending time and so much money in the way of taxpayer dollars if everyone in this room? Second, does WPD plan on entering into a new agreement with Ishtia? And third, final third, can WPD please post a new simple icon on its website showing A, the document that the WPD believes constitutes a binding agreement that is still in effect and an explanation of the legal reason for why it is still in effect? B, the last document received from Ishtia or his lawyer stating his current position? And C, the last document from WPD stating its position so the public can understand where the parties stand without having to spend hours making a FOIA request because there's some nonsensical argument that what you're doing on this is covered by a flawed confidentiality form and prevents us from trying to piece things together. That's all I have to say. Uh, I'll submit this. Uh, the one other thing, I know you're not so inclined to answer any questions, um, but given the fact that we take all the time to come and talk to you, it would be nice in an open session if someone perhaps could offer some perspective if you so desire to uh, do so. I sat on the wrong side of the microphone in a lot of public hearings, both on sides. And on the village council, we would make proposals, and um, we thought that they were based on things that we had been asked to do. And then we were informed, no, you know what, we don't like that solution at all. Forget about it. Forget about what we had to say. And we stopped. I could probably take you through three, three or four things that we were working on hard and we stopped because people didn't want it. And I have to say, I've never seen a set of comments, comments like this, particularly for a question that wasn't even asked. So I think that's, a, that's positive feedback in the sense that it's negative. And that should be something that's weird to you. I, I don't know what you need at this point. I don't know if you need a referendum. I know you don't need it for the money, but you may need it for the sense of confidence that you're doing the right thing and that you're being supported. Um, there's, I spent three hours yesterday reading 
real estate document on an August afternoon. And I shouldn't have to do that. That's a red flag. There's a red flag when I'm doing that in August because I now have some lack of confidence in what's going on. So please listen. When you get feedback and you're a public board, you're no longer a private actor. You're acting on behalf of the future. And that's what I hope that you'll work on doing. And I just wanted to touch on a few things tonight. Um, one of them, a couple of them have already been said, so I'm reviewing here. And I think what's left is I was asked to speak briefly about um, the difference in the appraisal values for this class. Now, this may be a moot point. Um, again, we're not all sure exactly <laughs> where things stand right now. But um, I was asked to clean this up, so I'm going to. Um, we know that the values of each front land are largely dependent on the beach front itself. And an argument can be made that when comparing the beaches on the two properties of the swap, the parcel at the south end of the Centennial is actually more valuable than 261 Sheridan. It has a much larger usable beach, it's more private, not sandwiched to the same two public parks. And it also doesn't have the cost of doing something in a house that no one seems to really want. Um, so I think that, along with other people who asked me to speak on this point, that if further talks about the land costs continue, that new appraisals need to be obtained. And um, especially, I heard that the appraisal for the property at the south end of the park didn't even include the, include the actual beach on the private survey. It was just for the land. So. Um, we all do know from past meetings that shows of hands that the parcel is not worth only $3 million. And we just think that the park district would want to risk being involved in any erroneous charitable deduction, especially in light of all the new public attention on this project. Um, so the last thing I wanted to say is that there has been some comments um, about being a good neighbor. And on behalf of all the residents bordering the park, I would just like to ask that we think about that phrase because some of us, if this walk did go through, instead of having a view of a beautiful park in Lake, in Lake Michigan, we'll likely be looking at a brick wall or at best a wall of trees. And that would be actually more detrimental to the enjoyment of our property than anything that happens along the beach borders for the north and south neighbors. So why aren't we considered neighbors? And we've been asked to sacrifice for the greater good, which you know, we are agreed to do. So please don't be afraid to ask the same from all of your neighbors. When someone buys a property next to a public beach and then doesn't want to have any of the issues that could arise from living at that location, isn't it like if someone bought a house near an airport and asked the city to have the airline not fly planes over their house? In conclusion, I appreciate the less is more plans that have been suggested, and I hope to see that come to fruition. I hope the village residents can save some tax dollars and that we can have a beach that blends seamlessly with the shoreline, respectful of the nature we have been entrusted to protect. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. I'm Steve Hewels, 804 Prospect Avenue. My wife Jane and I have uh, lived in Winnet for 25 years. We raised four children here who attended our fine public schools and were very acquainted with Tower Road Beach. I'm a frequent user of Lloyd's myself, where I have a sailboat and off 
up and launch my company. I, I am a huge fan of it. And I'll lay it back. I missed the opening of the meeting. I apologize. This is a news alert, but I want to start with thank you. Um, having reviewed the options offered for next week's workshop, I'm relieved and encouraged. The removal of the lake filling beach consuming planter pocket is certainly a step in the direction. Thank you. I feel like you're like you're listening to our people. I think it will contribute to restoring some of the trust that some residents have expressed. I certainly hope so. As we look forward to next week's workshop, my observation is that we're heavy on rock and light on iron. We have several options for each week that include rock. Great wall. We should have some alternatives that use more sheet pile long iron. This type of structure has been used along the lake shore for decades. Like rock, it has pros and cons. But as a community, we should be privy to a broader analysis of these alternatives. And one such option has been offered by Chuck Dowdle and was included in the material meeting. Chuck's proposal has many compelling attributes. His Elder Now proposal, and we started quickly, does require the expense and time of rock break law, gets, in which, therefore, gets Elder Beach back in use sooner, is independent of Centennial and the land spot, is much, it must be much. And rock breakwater option. It's probably faster, and it is certainly less disruptive for the residents who live near the elder and central. And I think for the community of, as a whole, having lived through the rebuilding of the school. So my request is to hope that the cost estimates for creating such an option be included in next week's workshop, just like the ones offered by the court department. Uh, I think that it will contribute to a more robust and informed conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Joe Dooley, and I would like to uh, thank Mark Lord for all of your hard work on this. I know you've taken into consideration the walls, the garden, the dog beach. We have proposals coming up next week to address all those issues. I think you addressed them very well. I moved into Winnipeg in 1991 and 1993. I was elected to the park board to sit where you sit today. I served on the board from 1993 to 2003. I sat in the board for six years as a time as president, and I saw my share of controversy. Sometimes when people are telling you you're doing the wrong thing, they're coming up with things that you're not even doing, and they're telling you it's wrong if you're doing it, it's hard. It's hard to stay the course. I'm here today to encourage you to stay the course. 2014, I was elected or asked to be an advisory board to build this master plan. I was the co chair of this master plan. This was vetted in the community through 14 open meetings of our advisory committee, many public open houses to show the plans that are being developed. Stakeholders were vetted in focus groups and meetings to discuss each and every one of these plans. Was specifically addressed in Peniel and Elder. As you know, Elder became part of the park district in 1958. The park district uh, started about 100 years ago, 1920. 58 Elder came. And uh, about 10 years later, in 59, we have Centennial. 
housing. So it was a 70 foot piece of property in between the divided those two pieces. For over 50 years, the park has said it had a dream of putting those two pieces together. They have the finest piece that would make it could have on the lakefront. We're talking about something to do by 2030, which will last 100 years from now, just like those people in the 20s with all the beaches that we are enjoying today, 100 years later. In the plan, we wrote the words that were very carefully chosen. And we asked, I asked, as the co chair of that committee, that you consider these when you are discussing whether to go forward on the last one. Yeah. Um, okay, I'll just stay close. Okay, in the, in the plan, we said Elder Lane and Centennial Park and Beach anchor the southern end of the Winnetka Lakefront system. While each of these lakefront parks is an individual park, they are discussed in this master plan as a symbolic whole. The master plan uh, speaks to four ways to combine these two special open space and lakefront areas to maximize both the open space for passive and active uh, programming. This is a, I'm going to skip some of it because you know where you can find it, but it says the district should drive, the district should drive to a long-term goal of bridging the gap between the two parts by purchasing a single family home and property between the two. The land swap accomplishes that. What I'm asking you to do is to plant this tree in a place where you may never sit under the shade. It's a good plan. How are you now? Your residents of this district will appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, we just switched up. We just switched up, Mike. So, see if that helps. Uh, Mary Garrison, 350 Ridge Avenue. Uh, I have uh, brought just a couple of. Uh, snapshots from 2014 of Elder Beach to show you what it looked like at that point. Compliments of uh, Susie, Susie, wherever you are. <laughs> um, it, it, um, it was a beautiful beach and it will come back and it's on its way back. So uh, that's something I'd like you to look at very carefully before we go to uh, the next meeting. Uh, the other thing I was uh, today in the library, unfortunately, my email uh, cable was cut, and so I was uh, trying to read all of that tonight. And, um, we do not have, the Park District does not have a packet in the library that people can read. Uh, and I'm requesting that maybe that this be done, uh, posted there also. Uh, the village has a packet of all their meetings, uh, but the park district does not. And there are people in this village who don't use internet phones or whatever. I mean, it's just it's a fact. Um, nothing wrong with those people, but they do have interest and they are contributors. So if that would work, I would appreciate it. Thank you very much. So, I, 
Edwin Echenko. I haven't done this since 2014. One time only, won't do it again. Since you guys all know, 10 of these are when I come. Now, um, <laughs> I, I know, it's my choice. That's the whole point. <laughs> so, I'm really kind of confused where we all stand now. Uh, notice that the permit's going to be applied to only by the park district and not by the private landowner. The plans in the packet would show an elder, you know, centennial, as separate entities. You know, I'm going to go with then, you know, some of the comments that were made. I'm going to go with the idea that the deal's off and it's going to have to be restructured because it comes back. And I think that's right because I think that the park district should use, should use the power it has to make a better deal. It would be great to have a combined beach, but it shouldn't be made at the expense of a bunch of uh, concessions which are inappropriate. So, a couple things that I would say is first, I am concerned by the consultants that are advising the park district. Specifically, Shavika, I am concerned that the interest that he has, which is building things on the lakeshore for money for private individuals, tempers the advice that he provides the board. And he does not provide advice that's necessarily in the public's interest. And so we've already paid him like whatever half a million dollars. I'm just concerned that his advice isn't necessarily fiduciary in nature to the board. So don't know if that's true or not. My concern based on comments and conversations I've had with him. So having said that, I think the park district should go ahead, do the two parts, leave the house in the middle. I would only suggest that we rip up the sheet pile that's on the south side of Elder that separates the property from the park because, you know, we really don't need it. And if we're going to put up a sheet pile or something else south of there, then that would be great because that would then make the beach very accessible to from uh, south to north. And then the park district could go ahead and I'll try to could go ahead and argue that the case for Undershe Knox, which is really not the precedent here, it was Seaman versus Smith in 1860 that suggested that the lake was different than the sea because it didn't have currents, tides, or changes in the season, is all wrong and inappropriate. And the park district could then have people walking up and down the beach. The value of the house would be even less, so the owner that purchased it out from under your feet to make a point would have even a harder time. And then if they want to take it to court, the park district could establish precedent that the lake is really, in Illinois, like everywhere else, up to that 489 watermark, and we could move on with a, a better lecture. Um, last two comments I want to make, three comments, I'm sorry, I'm over. Um, last two comments quickly. First, I don't think anything as low as possible, no rocks, clearly no pen pockets would be good. I know. Uh, two, um, I have come to the conclusion that while Dog Beach is nice, it doesn't, it isn't, it makes the beach uh, not open to the public and really shouldn't be there. And three, having heard what I just heard, the park district should re explore the idea of building a boardwalk between Tower and Lloyd because the land there is arguably not private any longer now that it's built out. If you look at the plants, it's village property because the village had nothing to do with the accretion. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. Uh, I'm John Rude, 326 Woodland Avenue. In the past workshop meeting, I was one of the few participants to present an alternate plan. My plan was based on Lloyd Beach's design and the Great Waters, and my plan were 100 feet shorter than the original design submitted by the Park Department and Orchard 2020 in February to the IDNR and the Army Corps. Eight of the nine options recently availed for Centennial and Elder Land are based on that February plan by the park and Orchard 2020. I was disappointed that my plan with breakwaters 100 feet shorter length was not included with the plan options being presented to the board. L looking at the cost estimates for the longer breakwaters, 
I've concluded that a 100 foot shorter breakwater at Elder would save 582,000 uh, versus, again, what you have in your eight alternate plans. And you'd also save an additional 219,000 on the sandfill, uh, resulting in a total savings of $801,000. At Centennial, a shorter breakwater would save 582,000 with an additional 225,000 for sandfill, resulting in savings of $807,000. Savings on both breakwaters would be 1.6 million. These savings are conservative because the main shortening occurs in deeper water, where the amount of stone required is much greater. My plan would result in a beach that would reach out the same distance into the lake as the beach at Lloyd, but would only be two-thirds the width of the beach of the original Orchard Park district plan. I don't think the extra beach is needed, nor do I think the additional expense is justified. I also question whether the 100 feet of steel sheet pile that ties the stone breakwaters to the toe of the bluff in eight of the nine plans that uh, have been submitted to the board is an effective uh, is as effective as stone breakwater to prevent erosion. I question whether the stone T that is missing from all of the eight plans uh, in the original orchard plan uh, is needed to prevent erosion. I would like to hear from Shadika's postal engineer on these issues at the upcoming meeting. Thank you. Without objection, we will act on the following items with a single vote. We have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. So we move. We go to the including special board meeting minutes of June 9th, 2022, closed session meeting minutes of June 16th, 2022. So move. Second. Second. Discussion. Discussion. Uh, today, I sent Elizabeth Baker an email that the I don't know that everything you do, you have time to look at it. That I had uh, certain permissions that were requested, and I, I sat with her there. She had time to listen on uh, the minutes of June 9th. I looked at it, but I didn't have a chance to. I saw your email, but I didn't have a chance to go back to the page or anything with that information. Uh, Mr. President, do you want me to go through? My my request, or do you want to table this for our next meeting? I prefer to table it for the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baker. All right, so we're going to remove the special board meeting minutes of June 9th, but uh, we can still act on approval of the closed session meeting minutes of June 16th, 2022. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Seaman. Commissioner Cota? Yes. Commissioner Archambault? Yes. Commissioner Lawson? Yes. Commissioner Rapp? Yes. Commissioner Root? Yes. Commissioner Jane? Yes. I'm curious. We're going to have a communication to Mr. Peterson. By your board packets uh, include uh, quite a number of communications from uh, indiv individuals and responses to individuals, as well as information from uh, various publications. So we did our best to aggregate everything we could possibly find that we can tackle. If there's anything else that should be noted that needs to be added to the packet, we're looking at that. Now, Mr. Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. All right, at this time, we are going to move on a new business, and we have a presentation from the Winnetka Youth Organization to the board who's going to move to those reserve seats that we can lower the screen and make the presentation here.
I'm Sissy Hassan. I'm sorry for my voice, but uh, I'm the executive director for a women's organization. Can I take a Thank you. I'm Sophia Hassan. I'm the executive director for One Decade Organization. So we're here to present on some of the things that we've been doing and also some of the past history of the organization. So the One Decade Youth Organization was founded in 1969 at the Teen Drop-In Center. We currently have three interns, so our center is open um, five to six days a week. We provide community service opportunities. It's meant to provide teens a substance-free space to participate in recreational activities, but we also do mentorship. That's something new that we're going to be starting for this upcoming school year, and that's actually um, a request from the youth. They wanted to get exposure to different career areas such as finance, accounting, medicine, etc. So we are going to be partnering up with the Chamber of Commerce so they can also get some leadership experience as well. And so we are located in the lower level of the Winneka Community House. We rent the space from there. And so the Park District has been one of our biggest funders throughout the years. Um, and part of those funds do go towards making sure that our space is able to stay open. So it does go towards the rent and also to help with some of the programs. And so some of the things that the teams have said about the youth organization are that it's like a second home to them. And recently, um, back in March of this year, we had the opportunity to mentor some teams. It was a collaboration with some local teachers. And this is some feedback that we did get in March of this year from two of the teams. One of them said, I just wanted to take the time to say thank you. I'm grateful to have been given this opportunity to speak with you and a few of my classmates. I wanted to say thanks for the words of encouragement. I feel that I don't get that often, and it feels good. Thank you for asking us questions and keeping the conversation authentic. And thank you for investing your time in me and listening to what I had to say. And one of the other teams also emailed us and said, I learned more about myself and how much experience and skills I have, and I never really noticed how much I've grown. So these are some of the feedback that we have received from the team. And it just goes to show how vital we are in the community and to the youth that we serve. We serve as both middle schoolers and high schoolers. And so they do see our space as a safe space, a space where they can develop leadership skills. If they have a project, we make sure that it happens. We had an alumni who was in his first year of college and he wanted to do a book drive to send books overseas. And with our support, he was able to donate over 300 books. We have another team um, now. She wants to donate things to the Philippines. And so we've been helping her collect items. And we'll be also um, supporting her with getting those overseas. Next slide. So the WIO team centers on teams and it aims to keep our safe space, welcoming, and programming relatable. So our youth board is very team driven. So the teams really shape the direction of the organization and they shape the programming that happens. And they play a vital role and planning out social service. We also partner up with the township. We get a lot of teams from the peer jury. And actually, um, since December, we've provided over 250 hours of mandated community service to the teams in the area. And that's just from December of last year until now. Uh, next one. So our staff includes myself. And then we do have um, three college level students who are interns. Two are at the bachelor's level and one is at the master's level. So we also provide a space to where they can come back, kids who are from the North Shore area, and they can intern with us as well to get those mandated hours. Some of the things that we offer the kids, um, the leadership group, so they lead our action committees on the youth board, so the social service committee, the music committee, education and culture. And as I mentioned, it's very team driven. <coughs> So they are able to really shape how the programming goes. And they also play a vital role in fundraising and outreach as well. Next slide. Some of the other things that we do are recreation and social service. One of the things that we did, we had some teams show up. We helped with the Rotary Club of Winneka Northfield. 
and we helped with packing 50,000 meals that went to the Ukraine. So that was one of our social service projects that we did complete. Right now, we're currently collecting in collaboration with the Rotary Club the bread tags that are on bread bags. A few thousand of those will get a wheelchair for a disabled team. And so we're partnering with Scarcely Resourced and Danielle Care. They're also used to reinforce prosthetics. And so that's one of the social service projects that's going to be ongoing. We're also collecting food items for the pantry at the township. Some of the other things that we're hoping to bring back this year are the burn, which is actually hosted right here at Washburn. So uh, in the past, pre-COVID, we were coming two days a week to reach out to seventh and eighth graders. And so we've been in communication with the principal and assistant principal at Washburn and hoping to bring back that programming as well. Um, between May of 2021 to May of 2022, um, at a combination of in-person and virtual events, we did have 977 visits from the kids. So that is duplicated. So if they came multiple times, we counted all of those visits. And as I mentioned earlier, between December of 2021 up until May of 2022, we provided over 250 hours of community service that they had to fulfill for the peer jury. Next slide. And these are some of the partners that we've had. We actually offered some education and prevention training for Live for Lolly. They came into a two part series with us. We also partnered with the Human Illinois Human Performance Project. They came with us actually to a health and wellness fair at New Cheer High School. We did a lot of mindfulness techniques right before exam time. And then we have continuing relationships with Warming House as well as Lynch Youth Services as well as the library. And so some of our past events that we're hoping to bring back in this upcoming year are our adulting one-on-one -on -one session. We've actually been contacted by social workers at the police department to bring back this programming to teach things about resume building and also to teach about cooking when they go to college, um, how to fill out college applications. We've been asked to provide tutoring again and also to help youth with um, their college essays. And that's coming from you through all our youth boards. And one of the other series that we're hoping to bring this year are how to become an influencer. And so that's where we're going to be providing the mentorship, hoping to get some support from the community if anybody's interested in mentoring or career coaching. Some of the teams have asked, you know, information on what they should do college wise and class wise if they want to get into different fields like financing and social work. So we're hoping to be able to match them up with people who can really guide them who aren't their parents. Next slide. And these are some pictures from some of the events that we've done this year. Over here, you see a lot of things that were packed. So December and January, we partnered with Warming House and Wilmette, and we were able to collect toiletry supplies uh, to donate to the night ministry. So I actually used to work on the night ministry. I was the team lead and the street medicine case manager. So we did a lot of outreach to the homeless population. And you'd be surprised how many of the teams that I saw on the streets who came from the north suburbs, the west suburbs. And so we were actually able to pack 67 hygiene bags and over 80 emergency period packs. Um, you would think that period products were something that get given out to homeless women, but it's not. So that was something that we were able to do in partnership with the volunteer center for the MLK Day of Service. Uh, we also did educational equity outreach um, in partnership with the Evanston STEM School. So we went around talking to residents of Evanston who are of different demographics about their experience in the educational system. And also to get their input on names for a new school that's being built there. So the teams really got to get exposure to a different demographic and a different class of people. And then up at the top, you can see the boxes of the meals that we packed in partnership with the Rotary Club. Those were the meals that went to the Ukraine. Next slide. That might be the last slide. <laughs> that might be the last slide. Thank you. So, you know, we just came here to share a little bit about our history and some of the ideas that we have coming up. Uh, the Park District has been a huge supporter and funder for a lot of the things that we're doing at the youth organization, and we're just hoping to have that continued support as we're launching some of those new programs and getting our youth board relaunched for the new school year. So thank you for giving me the time and the space today.
Any questions or comments on the presentation? I just want to talk to you about um, uh, one question. Do you know what the unduplicated count is for your participation? Uh, I can get that number to you. Okay. Yeah. Just curious. Yeah. And then one comment. I think this landscape for junior high and high school assistants in Glencoe, they have two separate agencies. I think they still have the Glencoe Junior High Project and then the Glencoe Teen Drop-In Center in that little building in the park. And then in Wilmette, they have the Drop-In Center for the um, middle schoolers. And then they also have a Teen Drop-In Center at the warming house. In Winnetka, I think we just have the Yo and the Burr. Right. That's right. They get free space in Wilmette, rec free space from the Park District, and village support. They get free space in Glencoe and Park District and village support. And in Winnetka, they get village support, they get Park District support, but they do not get free space. So your exactly. rent profile is different. That's all I wanted to say. I just have a question. Can you hear me? The best mic. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for your presentation. Thanks for coming. My question is, have you submitted the 2021-990 form that you filed with the IRS so we can look at it? Um, I can submit that to the trial. That's what I've been communicating. Super. And, and then, do you know offhand what your reserves are? No, not offhand. Okay. Well, thank you. If you do that, we very much appreciate it. And thanks again for coming. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to uh, unfinished business, starting with Elder and Centennial. I do want to note that we're not intending to discuss the plans that were submitted. We are we are going to talk broad strokes, uh, design. There are nine new plans, nine cost estimates that were included in today's work back. We will be sending out an email blast to residents tomorrow including those <coughs> plans and cost estimates, inviting everyone to review them and come with questions and comments to the workshop session, which will be held a week from tonight, 6 p.m. Uh, on August 25th, and we will be back at the Hubbard Woods School where we work for the prior presentation. That will be a workshop session with the open discussion and dialogue regarding nine different plans. Would anybody like to make comments on Elder Centennial Matter this time? Any board members? I just want to thank everyone. I've learned a lot in the course of this process since we began um, with our public commentary back in March and um, April and May. And I think that you can see we've made some progress. We've made big changes. And I think some people have acknowledged those, but I do want to specifically address them. We've had several business sessions on July 2nd and July 13th. We've had a big workshop in um, in July also. We're planning more, planning as many as we eight. And so we get a plan that people can um, support uh, pretty broadly. So the louvers are gone, the walls are gone, the planter pockets are gone. And I just want to make sure everyone understands that. And what we're talking about now is stone versus steel, and we're talking about um, separating the project into two different zones, into two different sort of sets and sort of And what I just have to say, I know that there is uh, interest. There is interest. to listen um, around this weekend, up around next weekend. I may just be around the following weekend. So I think with all the new information, ideas, I think it'd be a really good time to get two board members at a location that we can listen and uh, get feedback. If you publicize, that might be Is it going to be open to the yeah. So we'll have to confirm. 
confirm some times and get that out in an email or on the website. Vicki, do you have any comments? I just wanted to confirm, like, will Chuck's presentation be included in the workshop materials? Is anyone opposed to that? I feel like there's been some thought put in to make sure that that's discussed. I know, I know that he has some questions. Like, like the last time, Chuck, Chuck's presentation in the board packet tonight, be in the presentation packet, where he'll have the opportunity to present the plan at the workshop session. And anybody else that wants to come up with plans can present plans during the workshop session. That's the purpose. All right. I appreciate everyone's comments. We are listening. And uh, I, as a co-chair of the Lakefront Master Plan, know that there was a great deal of time and effort put into listening input from all constituents. I would encourage everyone, if you have not read that document, please do so. It was developed over a period of more than a year. I won't belabor you with all the details because you'll find all the details of the public input session and the various interest groups that were represented to arrive, to arrive at that plan. So please familiarize yourself with that document as well as the additional document that the uh, LA Coastal Management Program published in 2011 as part of our prior board package. That there you will learn a great deal about the Lake Michigan Lakefront and the uh, nature of the improvements that are being proposed. So I look forward to seeing everybody next week. Move on to the storm. Hey, oh, sorry. Do I, do I get oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Number one, um, this is nepotism. My husband, John Ruth, submitted a plan. I'd like to see his plan also reflected if, if that is acceptable with the board. You may consider that nepotism not acceptable. Secondly, um, he made a comment tonight that I would like to reinforce. In looking at um, the Lakota design and in looking at the cost uh, Summaries and, and thank you, Coaster, for all your work in getting that done. Thank you. Uh, what I don't see is any engineering behind it. And I suspect that there have been, uh, or at least there is, coastal engineer data and information. And I think that would be really good to have. And it might be good to have a coastal engineer present at this workshop. It's just a question. Uh, then my third comment is I want to thank Mr. Dooley for coming. I want to thank Mr. Dooley for all of his work. And and I read I read my own extensively. I wanted to go even further in my digging and I wanted to find the minutes. I wanted to find the questions that were asked in the focus group. I wanted the details. And um, unfortunately last week that they were not available, but Mr. Peterson advises me that you now have all that the minutes. Okay, I think that's very important that we have in our official records. And finally, I'm going to read from this plan, just a brief part of it. Um, quoting from the plan, page 79, it is a living plan that sets out a range of improvements over a 15-year plus time horizon. As a living plan, it must be regularly revisited and reevaluated by the Park District staff and board for consistency with goals and objectives, community sentiment. In other words, we need to listen to what our community is saying. Fiscal condition. If we're financially constrained, then we need to adjust our plan and environmental conditions. The uh, caucus comments were extensive. 470 some people commented. Over 95 of those were about this particular issue. I hope each of us takes the time to carefully look at those comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to stormwater construction update. Go ahead. Or thank you. Currently, the project is ongoing. Um, Homer Industries is out today for a the job to start with some of the tree removals. The group from the Mayo, who is the contractor who was awarded the project, is continuing on in their efforts. 
Uh, we're still moving on track and we're excited to see progress moving on that front. As we continue to move through that, um, there are going to be items that we're going to be bringing back to the park board that are directly related to improvements for the golf course, not only as it relates to the park three, but 1804. So we'll be coming forward in time. As we transition, um, I'd also like to start talking about some of the follow up um, items that will have to be discussed tonight that are going to be a little bit more pressing. But any questions as it relates to construction overall that I can answer for the board? Uh, okay. Sure. So yesterday, August 17th, Nikki Arsenbo, Chris Stulis, John Peters, and I met with Chris Brent, Ian Price, Rob Ahan, and Jim Bernal of the Village of Winnetka, along with Mike Walter of Brandon Associates, and Rick Jacobson of Big Golf Course Design. Uh, for a little bit of history, Nikki and I negotiated the intergovernmental agreement with Chris and Andy. So we were the principals negotiating on behalf of each of our bodies, and of course, Rob and John Peterson, Post and Jim were involved as well. The purpose of the meeting was to discuss the cost allocation to park district uh, for, to the cost to the park district for stormwater and golf course approvals. Prior to the meeting, Post and Tulis identified $229,850 of cost allocated to park district that might be more appropriate for appropriately borne by the village. So what that goes. The village responded with a detailed explanation that the contract is a work for golf course related improvements exceeded the initial engineer's estimate of profit construction cost by $4,778,863. But the village uh, honored its commitment as negotiated in the IGA, assuming entirely the cost of rental. The village was steadfast in its refusal to, to assume any additional cost but we agreed to continue to identify opportunities to reduce costs prospectively. The village provided the park district details of golf course cost increases being full covered by the village, and this will be distributed to the board for further review and will be included in a subsequent board package. The meeting just took place yesterday. Please note that the IGA includes provisions that will reduce golf course operating expenses, including reduction in the Potable water rate charged by the village to the park district and a reduction in the anticipated use of potable water due to a substantially increased volume of water available for irrigation by way of new pumping station and a much larger surface area of the pond. It also includes the elimination of stormwater fees related to the golf course in the adjacent watershed areas. So, a simple math for me. The village is investing an additional $4,778,363, and the park district has to increase its share by $229,850. In spirit of cooperation, I recommend that we accept the allocation as provided by the golf course in question. Nikki or David? I'll go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah, having said in the meeting, I would I would echo what Warren is saying is, you know, in effect the village is saying it, it's almost a five million dollar more investment that they were planning on, but it is to the betterment of the golf course, to, to the betterment of the water quality that's going to go through storm water. Uh, there are a lot of improvements uh, that they're have taken on and they could have been said fast and said no, but they said go with it. So I would agree with Warren for they're they're looking for a to contribute to that, I'm, you know, yes, yeah, money, but I'm fully in favor of what we're doing because we're going to get a far better stormwater system. We're going to get a far better golf course system. Happy to answer any other questions. Yeah, I'll go ahead.
Yeah, and the thing's going to be back backdated because it was to go into effect the day they put shovels in the ground. So, again, it, it, it's just not a million bucks, but I'll take the money. Right. Has the village made any assurances to us that they'll actually pay for the stormwater uh, relocation as part of all the construction? That was the second part of the conversation. Uh, which is approximately what 450,000 bucks and it's their stormwater. So, as part of the proposed improvements to Pelzer, it includes the replacement of a 1920 vintage storm sewer pipe that runs from Sheridan to the Bluff, along with about a 1940, 1948 pier and stormwater discharge. So, it also includes storm water quality improvement enhancements. Close to the tune of is it 500? Not nearly, uh, $600 total. $600,000. Yeah, it's, 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 you know, $600,000. So we have made a request to the village, recognize that that is a village stormwater improvement, and they should contribute to the cost of building the centennial to those improvements, which are clearly outlived their useful life. Uh, it's evidenced by section of the corrugated metal pipe that washed up on Elder Beach a couple of weeks ago after it uh, deteriorated and fallen off the end. And if anybody's seen here, that's in disrepair as well. Those negotiations continue. Okay. Uh, yeah, one more piece to that is, so the village did agree with us that they strongly believe that there are grants available uh, to be able to help the funding of that uh, pipe replacement and relocation. Um, so they are, you know, their pledge is to work hand in glove with us to try and get whatever funding they can get by grants or any other method they can to help pay for this. So they're partnering the best they can. I, wonder, I do want to be respectful of the village and know that uh, Chris and the fact team the village has worked exceedingly hard to bring together many disparate interests to get this plan approved and move forward with it. With respect to the cost, we are in an environment, in an inflationary environment, where construction costs and fuel are very you know, changed remarkably since the original conception. So, the, both our cost estimates for Elder and Centennial and the villages did for this work reflect that. So, so the reality that we have to deal with. With respect to improvements to the golf course, this body will be presented with a number, or we've been presented with a number of alternatives. We will be deliberating on those alternatives and cost of them, and we will be considering them and their impact on our capital improvement budget for 2023. The expectation posted that we have decisions made and forwarded to the village by what time frame? Our objective is to have them approved prior to the work constructing on the golf course in November. So we'd be looking to have these back to the board in September for consideration and then ultimately by the end of October for approval to start in on the north half of the Eagle Okay. Very good. Thank you. All right. Any other questions or comments? The stormwater update. You, I, I just have a question. Um, I know that things were really slightly the groundbreaking. Is everything now kind of caught up? Is the golf course still closing at the same time? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so everything's kind of back on track from our standpoint. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We do have. We do have one matter that needs to, to be addressed immediately. So, may I have a motion to approve stormwater alternate number 20, irrigation contractor removal of existing irrigation heads by Hallard and Young, meaning the subcontractor of the Mayo Brothers State, South Road Village, Illinois, for a cost of $25,410 as recommended. So, I'll move. Second. Any discussion? One more. Warren, thank you. Uh, as discussed, as part of the alternate number 20 here, this was originally conceived to be work completed by the Parks District 
in an effort to try to consider the potential uh, issues that might follow the installation of the irrigation system as far as two different entities working on the same project and ultimately having issues with uh, how these are capped off or secured during the removal process that could then potentially uh, domino into other greater effects of the irrigation system. As the cost identified, plus the labor shortages being currently on the, on the golf course maintenance staff, it's at this time the Park District staff is recommending for a recommendation to move forward with alternate 20 as identified for calorie out for a sum of 25,410 that was bidded through the village process through the Fair and Equitable Bidding Act. Any further comments? And, and that was one of the alternates that we had discussed that was on your preliminary, it was on your list that we said, you know what, that's fine. Okay. If there's no further discussion, roll call, please. Commissioner Cota? Yes. Commissioner Archambault? Yes. Commissioner Luffin? Yes. Commissioner Rack? Yes. Commissioner Root? Yes. Commissioner Seaman? Commissioner James? Yes. All right, moving on to proposed sale of Library Park. Mr. Peters. Yes. Thank you, uh, Warren. Uh, your packets include two appraisal reports, one from DOS uh, Group and another one from Mike Bruce for Library Park. Those are the two appraisals secured by the Park District. We also uh, recently received a, an appraisal report from two Enright per organization. Uh, those three appraisals, when they average, come to a uh, property value of $313,000 for a library park. We then worked with Adam Simon of the Ansel uh, Link to put together a letter of intent and we sent to the library a letter of intent uh, representing the proposed sale of library park to the library. That letter of intent was reviewed by the library board of trustees who passed Monday. Uh, they have since signed the letter of intent, which now allows the park district to move forward to a draft of a purchase agreement, which will then be presented to the library for their board of trustees to review on September 19th. Assuming the library uh, accepts the proposed purchase agreement, uh, it would then come to the park district for its approval on of the 22nd of September. Once the two organizations and assuming the two organizations approve the purchase agreement, it would trigger a 40 day uh, due diligence period, uh, which then pushes us into a completion of the process of the sale somewhere in November or December of 2022. Um, so there are terms and conditions associated with the letter of intent uh, that are in your board packet, notably. That the net proceeds of the transaction will be used for the shoreline improvements at Elder and Centennial. Um, and there's also some commitments to Northfield residents, who otherwise do not have resident base for our beaches uh, for a period of time um, subsequent to the purchase agreement being finalized. So, um, <coughs> unless there are any questions, I do want to acknowledge Commissioner Cotto, Commissioner Seaman, uh, fantastic work to get to the point that we're at. So, thank you very much for each of your.
Uh, yes. People may remember we had um, put this on the agenda last month. Um, we have put this on the agenda last month to discuss um, referencing kind of part extensive criminal process of the board. I think that it would be helpful for us as the board to kind of just reflect on that and think about as we do go down this road again to have some further discussion about what would be appropriate checkpoints for the board. I think everyone is highly engaged now in the details of the multiple options and it's good that we have multiple cost cost options to consider. Um, so I wanted to just tee up that discussion. I'm also appreciative and respectful of the significant community engagement that we have now on this project because I think that's a big positive to um, to have the input coming in in various forms and then before we really appreciate it and our thought that we can incorporate that. Um, so the things that I have, have taken away were, you know, definitely improving a plan collectively in an open session as a board um, prior to moving forward um, with, you know, tentative costs. Um, also, I see we've kind of come to the end of some of the agreements that we had with our supporting vendors. Um, so it would be helpful to have a discussion about what we expect to see from that as we re-engage and move forward. Um, the other checkpoint that, that I had noted was definitely uh, following any kind of um, bidding process. And before that, um, for the permits, it seems like people have kind of taken the plan and then gotten the permit. Um, but I know that it was a little bit, at least from my perspective, a gap to not have those permit documents circulated amongst the board before submission. So I think that that's something that we may want to discuss further. And then the other thing that I took away from what, you know, some other purchases have said was just make sure before fundraising that they have an approved plan that the community is behind, that the board is behind. Um, and, you know, what is some consideration and discussion around that? So, does anyone have any thoughts? It was a lot. I would say now that we're no longer bound by the confidentiality, which is, um, it frees us up quite a bit, um, I think we can distill the input that we're going to receive at next week. Session, we can schedule another listening session and fill that and put you straight up and put on the phone. And, a, um, and we're going to use those next sessions, the next listening session to be scheduled, the next workshop session on the 25th. We should have a very good idea of what people would support, and that should narrow those up. And then we can narrow further. Not the perfect process, but it better gives us a better um, way to distill the focus. I think. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, Costa, Costa, where are we on our contract with Shabika and also the Dakota Group? Uh, do we still uh, do we still have a term that is still in effect? Uh, apologize for the musical mic. Um, we are currently exhausted with our accounts with both of those. We have been built on an hourly rate to continue on with design materials that have been needed to provide uh, public input. So currently, Shabika is closed out. We did not fulfill the term of what that was. And as far as Lakota, once again, they've been on a time and materials basis to help the design work. As you'll see in the packet, there are stock costs that are still hidden with each design to help with the engineering once there is a design reach to further that all the way through design drawings, including permit, as well as any additional uh, requirements, structural engineering, mechanical engineering, 
anything that needs to be support that design to take it from um, from the beginning to end. So then do I understand the thing we are at the end of term on with these two consultants that we would, depending on where we head with our design, take them out for formal bids so that we have providers, other providers who can come in and have the opportunity to make proposals. That would be something that the park board ultimately would have to decide on and direct staff on how to move forward. Our ability to continue on with the new proposal for each one of these entities is still perfectly valid because we currently have a relationship and a good standing relationship with each one of them. I, I would like to comment on that briefly. There is a lot of valuable work that's been accomplished. It includes subcontractors to Lakota, uh, including civil engineering, and, uh, or to be social engineering, and much of that work is still very, very useful to us. We start over with the new vendor, which seems, in my estimation, a much more costly endeavor. Uh, thus, I think it, it, we should be prudent as we consider that it will largely depend on what time we move forward. I guess uh, I, I, I understand your comment. I also uh, agree it will depend on, on what design. But quite frankly, as we head into this new era for the park district of uh, focus on governance, transparency, and communication, I would like us uh, to see uh, putting together a list of uh, prospective consultants that includes certainly Shavika and Lakota, but also others that have provided design work in to other districts in our area. It would be interesting to see where, if we did this, what the various bid proposals would be. And again, my focus is, is very much on cost containment as well as opportunity for new ideas, uh, there, there we go. Maybe an actual coastal engineer coming in and, and looking at this. I understand that Shavika, if I'm correct, from time to time does contract with a coastal engineer, but is not a coastal engineer. Am I correct on that? Okay, I just want to refocus this conversation. We're on a discussion of board review and approval process for designing construction projects over 250,000. No, I understand that. And the policy deadline. Right. I'd like to reserve comment, elder sustained for that. Very well. But again, I hope that the record reflects that I'm very interested in expanding our bid. So thank you very much. Sure. We have a comment from Mr. Post. So are we in agreement that we will vote on plan before it's submitted? We can get copies of the, if we go to permit, we have copies of the application. I know that that's a staff function, but I think it would be good to have a chance to look at it broadly with the group for those who are interested. Um, that we need to uh, also consider the vendors, and then we get to the fish process, and then we also solicit donations after we have an approved design. Can, can I go on board with that? Is that can I make one suggestion? Yeah. I, I don't I don't know if you need to make a formal motion because what you're you're kind of doing is a, a hybrid. It's it's a motion as well as you want to make a policy change, which we we can't really make a policy change. So if you I would suggest that you introduce this is because this is so tied to elder centennial right that's what's really a driver so if, if you want to make a formal motion at the meeting next week a succinct motion so and then we can get a look at it and then we can vote on that motion is that is that fair to you 
I would think that this would come in the context of the board guidelines, and thus it's a policy matter that should be further developed. Right? Mm -hmm. It has to be distilled to writing in the process. Mm -hmm. I would just like to make sure that as a board, we're in alignment on what some of the checkpoints are as we move forward to the current project, but also what our policy is for some of these larger projects. So I'm happy to write something up. But I wanted to get you know, a reaction from people to see if this would make sense, what are some of the... Yeah, I think we're all open to that. I don't think we see anybody opposed. I do want to clarify that, that both you and Colleen came into this process at a point in time when we were proposing litigation against Orchard 23. And that's now obviously publicly well known, but we were in a litigation mode. We engaged outside counsel to bring an action for specific performance against Orchard 2020 when, we, when you guys came on the board. So there was a lot of discussion that took place in executive session, all of which has been released to in the effort of transparency, but there were obvious reasons with pending threat litigation that we couldn't go into great detail or didn't wish to go into great detail. We're starting fresh, got different different perspectives, and think the guidance we propose guidelines are necessarily appropriate, but they don't want the audience to Misconstrue where we were and how we got to the point where we. Since you're talking about moving forward, yeah, and not talking about the past, so I'm all for I'm all for rules and clarity and procedures and policies, especially when it comes to dollars. So again, I don't know if we can, as a board, make a, a amendment to the existing policy manual without a full. Uh, review of the policy. I don't know. I I think it's a motion that can be made specific to Elder Centennial Project. That's what's really driving it, I think. And let us review your, your motion and then we can vote out of the motion. I, I agree. We want checkpoints. This is a very expensive investment. So I'm supportive of it. I think a motion is the best way to do it. Is it possible to put it on the agenda for the 25th? That's what David is proposing as a short. If, if I can make a comment from the staff perspective, and I apologize for know this is for discussion, but the 25th is intended to be a workshop session. I think it's best suited to go at the committee meeting uh, in September. I think that would be the most prudent spot. And then you could go ahead, distill down, have a little bit of time to digest it, and then bring it to a formal board vote it meet me at the September, or if it's something decided from that point in October. Then you know, I can assure you that the policy that you're looking to set forward is our, is our typical working our 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 process, thank you, <laughs> that we normally work through. The only addition to that would be the permits coming to the board for ultimately review. It, might, it would be review versus approval. I guess that would be a question based on what other policy terms are. But everything that you say or you're suggesting to be done would be a lot of technical where normal policy, or in this case, not policy, but our normal actions are as we proceed with any purchase above 25000 not 250000 but 25000 Okay, good. Yeah, I think 250000 I put it as a benchmark. Like the large project, I think it might have a little bit more. Okay. We continue. We we'll move on to Nick Corwin Playground Renovation. They have a motion to approve the base bid from D and J Landscaping, Greenwood, Illinois, with an alternate stone seat wall for total bid price of two hundred three thousand four hundred fifty-eight dollars and thirty cents, with the understanding that any outcomes to change the bid cost. Brought back to the park board for further consideration. So we a second. Yeah. Discussion. Costa. Warren, thank you. Uh, as previously presented at the May 12th uh, committee meeting and then ultimately at the May 26th park board meeting, uh, we went ahead and presented a design concept in the foreign park and included the playground renovation. At that time, we called out the hardscape and everything else that was part of the plan design and also 
ultimately got a decision to move forward with the purchase of the playground equipment to move forward as far as the timelines to help reduce operating costs for a markup from a third party lender on uh, selling it back to us, if you will. And then also being mindful of the timeline uh, with the construction process. Since then, staff continued on that same wavelength for the project to bid out the construction of the playground itself. That process was a bid process that was open on August 9th of 2022, which four, four firms uh, completed our submitting bid to. As Warren suggested, the Bay Landscape, a uh, company from Shorewood, Illinois, had the lowest base bid of $203,458.30. The additional support for the alternative of the stone replacement seat wall, seat wall versus the concrete was a wash. The deduct from the base bid of that line item to include the alternate was a wash for that vendor, identifying them as the lowest, um, lowest qualified vendor after review of the um, our reference check. The project overall, in consideration of both the base price of the bid as well as the expense of the playground, has put us over what we anticipated for budget. As Warren stated earlier, the driving cost in place and what we've seen in the construction market has put things in a little bit of a tailspin. That initial cost was $230,000 of what we had budgeted for the project. In the over the few years, the Corey Foundation had a, a net proceed of $38,213.12 that they had donated back to the park district as an opportunity to get back to the community. Those funds were intended to be delivered and put back into the Nicole Park, and what better place than to help put them right back into the playground of what they were originally intended for. So by adding those funds in, the net process or the net cost for this process was going to be short under or over budget by $38,413.18. We have taken a look at Half Road and identified that part to hold back on the replacement of the half rule world playground um, renovation of what we had intended of 405,000. So the overall capital cost would come down. During this process, the color palette was identified from design and review as something that needed to be reviewed. Unbeknownst to the partners or staff, that was something that we were not anticipating because we had stuck with the same color palette of greens and tans. Uh, the one color that we did to light in Lamont, which is a little bit more of a uh, more brilliant green than a traditional, say, forest green, I think put uh, that into a little bit more perspective. The park staff is looking to present next week, Wednesday, on the 24th to design and review. The other issue that came up was the height needed for the variance from the zoning board, being the, being the largest single story structure. On the, on the property being the playground, the height requirement was to limit us to 15 feet. What we've heard in the past was to increase the shade around the park structure, and it's these shade canopies that were designed as part of the playground project that has put us to an elevation of 21 feet 10 inches. So we're approximately six feet over the threshold, six feet 10 inches over the threshold of what is allowable by the zoning board. We are planning on presenting to the zoning board. Um, I believe it's September 8th, if memory serves. I apologize if that date is incorrect, but looking to get a zoning variant for this project as well. If anything that would come out of those two meetings that would potentially have a cost effectiveness to this in regards to additional costs that we would bring back to the park board to vote on and continue to decide how we want to move forward with the project. So that's where we're looking for the presentation, and then if there's any questions that I can help answer. So your proposal, after it's completed, and I go to Nick Crowley Park, and I'm like, that's as, as the same quality as we have in Dwyer, Hubbard Woods. You're talking about the same quality level, experience level that we have with these other parks. In the packet, there are design illustrations that show that along with the color palette, it shows the structures that are going to be included, including the motion that was identified in the past to include the adapted swing for the swing set, along with the 2 5 structure as well as the 512 structure to make sure that we're you know, giving back to a large, larger broadcast of an audience for all members. Yeah. 
two to five means eight hundred. Right? Eight hundred, correct? Yeah. Right. yeah. Call it that eight hundred. You want to thank Costa for putting together the next picture for our presentation. That was fun. We had a number of questions at a time, so it's going to make our meeting a little bit shorter. But I definitely appreciate the effort, and hopefully, it's um, picture in four minutes as well. But thank you very much. Our pleasure. Any further comments? All right, there's a motion and a second. A roll call, please. Commissioner Archambault. No. Commissioner Lawson. Yes. Commissioner Rex. Yes. Commissioner Root. Yes. Commissioner Stevens. Yes. Commissioner Coro. Yes. Commissioner James. Yes. The juries on the new business centers, tennis center exterior painting proposal. We have a motion to approve the contract with FH Fashion, S. N. Nielsen and Associates LLC, Chicago, Illinois, for a combined total not to exceed sixty-four thousand two hundred and seventy dollars. Discussion. Warren, thank you. Um, as suggested, the AC Nielsen Tennis Center uh, is in the that room or is in June or paint job. Um, as you've been, as you, I'm sure you've seen and looked at the facility, the extra spaces of the building, uh, those that are not red, are definitely in due to paint job. Um, with past 10 years of the agency and him dating back even prior to that, there's been no time in which those have been identified that they actually have been painted in the last 30 years. So we're definitely due for a paint job. With that being said, and due to the location of this and the nature of the finish on the court, we did look to go back to a known entity of or of, of a, 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 a passion as a Nielsen who has done collaborative work for us in the past. Their work is being completed as part of a job order contracting program, which is normally bid through the state of Illinois for programs as it relates to construction services. Those services rates are set and identified through the state, and then each job is classified based on unique quantities to go ahead and complete the cost that would go with that job. We did identify the base painting of both the South and West Beta. But doing the North Asia at this time, we're looking at the reserve that kind of had, both Pat and I delivered that, deliberated and suggested that it made the most sense not to break stride and to have the contract to continue on with the entire facility at this time. We were trying to be a little bit more mindful fiscally, initially in the bid process, excuse me, in the budget process back in 20, November 2021. But as we looked into the facility further, it made sense to go ahead and move on the entire facility at this time. I know Pat can open up to any questions that you might have. Um, Pat's with us this evening, um, but if I can answer any questions that you might have as part of the process, I would like to. So, that is interior and exterior, just exterior. Just exterior, all three sides. The timing? The timing is perfect. We're going to align that in with the closure of the course and the downturn, so the timing works out well. So, within about what, the next month and a half, we're going to get that completed. With the amount of outdoor courts we have on good days, we can move play to the, the South Bank courts, we'll close the courts that we're working on. Uh, they'll be done by the time the high school comes through the courts outside, so we don't see any destruction at that time. Less destruction um, during good weather than our time. Any further questions? All right. Roll call, please. Commissioner Watson. Yes. Commissioner Rapp. Yes. Commissioner Root. Yes. Commissioner Seaman. Yes. Commissioner Coro. Yes. Commissioner Archambo. Yes. Commissioner James. Yes. I'm curious. Thank you. On to review of policy manual guidelines for commissioners. Thank you. Yeah, I'll take that. Uh, Thank you. This this is kind of my topic, my agenda. So I know board members may be tired of me getting on the soapbox for this, but um, I had the you know I've had the opportunity in seven years on the board to attend uh, IAPD conferences, and um, they were wonderful learning sessions. I learned a whole lot. Um, 
uh, uh, myriad of subjects, uh, but clearly a lot of things that, that would be helpful to us that unfortunately we don't have in the policy manual. Um, so um, we kind of a couple things. One, um, I think it's a good refresh that we should, you know, every now and again look at the policy manual. You know, like kind of refresh your memory. Uh, it's a good thing. Um, secondly, um, you know, one of the things that is near, I think, is maybe we're going to have to talk about going in the future, but really towards to the present. Um, and this is my opinion. Um, we are going to staff and asking them for a whole heck of a lot of stuff. And, and all of us, everyone. We ask the stuff, we just assume we can get it. And you know, we don't know what else they're working on this stuff, and they don't want to say no to us, and they bend over backwards to accommodate us. But it's overwhelming. Uh, we're dreading this staff. Um, and I relate it to, I'm sure, in all of our working careers, we've had a time where someone came with a wheelbarrow and dumped a whole bunch of work on it, and we have no idea how we want to get it done. It's stressful. You keep up at night. It's difficult to be able to do your job with a fresh mind. Um, so that's just a plea, guys. Let's please be kind of some of what we're asking for. And we also have to be prepared if we ask for something. The answer is no. Is I'm going to do the best I can to get to it, but here's what I expect you to be able to do. So I just hope we can all adopt that before we ever put it into a policy. One more thing, and, and this is a vow for me, and um, a voluntary to this. So I'm the one that put on the soapbox for this issue about inboarding and trading and stuff like that. That you know, Cynthia Tommy, you came on board. There's so much stuff going on. It was literally trying to inboard and do training was impossible, uh, and we were still doing some COVID stuff at the time. So I'm not, I don't want to get on this so much, but I am volunteering to get information that best practices from other parts of it that I will bring to the board that we can discuss that might be really good things to put in the policy and address it, that will be addressed more than what we have. So if you guys agree with that, I'm in, I'll get it. It's my so far, I'm happy to do it. We'll discuss whatever we put on.
with all the separate programs. We've obviously had this extraordinary issue with the elder and centennial matter. And with that have come numerous FOIA requests, which uh, supersede many of the day-to-day duties or add to them. In addition, the, the extra meetings, the different meeting locations, all require additional work from staff. And I know that they're staff. So I would ask each of us board members to be respectful of that. You know that they do have lives outside the park district and they're doing everything they can to serve our needs. So I want to offer the thanks to staff for your extraordinary efforts to make these meetings run smoothly, prepare the minutes, prepare the agendas, the issue of the press, all the work associated with FOIA, and posting all the documents. We have tremendous amount from you. Very grateful for your efforts and hope that you will continue to persevere as we work through these extraordinary issues. Thank you. Uh, if you want to comment one more thing, uh, we have been in the press quite a bit lately, and I think it would be uh, helpful if we consider board policy for when we speak to or address by the press, if we consider that and develop some <coughs> guidelines or particular other guidelines and other boards. I know I talked to Village about their policies, so I think it would be great for us to develop the policy so it could be more. Or if I could add one thing it, to Mickey, to your point, I have already done a lot of that homework and I have been for many years. And I, Colleen and I did speak briefly to it, and Cynthia and I, I have several manuals and information about media so i do have a lot of information and be happy to work with you when when time allows but um but i have done a lot of homework so i would if you want to do it again um but maybe we could talk first before you take additional steps yeah no, I, my first step is going to be to try to gather as much information as i can do i know that you have a great resource where Three 
you know, key items because I don't view those as controversial at all. Thank you. And thanks, Mickey, for your input. Yeah, Mickey will. I looked at it and we can't have more than two commissioners on the same email, so I had one week to large board teams in the meeting. Thank you. Happy to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a question procedurally. The vote that we took to the board was negotiating this contract. Is that good or do we have the final contract that we need to vote again? And do we believe that that will happen September 22nd or do we need to put a special meeting together on the 9th? Like, it's just what's the timing? What else? There's other steps to close it out when you guys get to a contract that you're happy with. Do we need to do anything else with the board? I just want to make sure that we need to accelerate things or not, that we have that in our timing and plan. So I'd be happy to review the notes from the vote uh, from our last board meeting. I do believe we voted to allow Commissioner Cotto and Commissioner Seaman to finalize the document and negotiate with the Kemper Sports, but I also would be happy to bring it to each board member, review the terms and conditions. We could follow a consent of the uh, agreement. Uh, as uh, struck with Kemper Sports through individual conversations and then have a final vote uh, September 8th. That would allow us to actually begin the process, assuming every commissioner views the uh, terms and conditions as favorable, um, and then we can then finalize everything with a special board meeting following the committee of the whole meeting on September 8th to the uh, final meeting. Is that no, it sounds good to me. I just want to make sure it's covered. I mean, like I know I'm so grateful for the work that Commissioner Cotto and Commissioner Stephen have done to wrap this slide and all the due diligence. I just want to make sure that we're in a position to close the deal. Yeah. Whatever we need to do procedurally, you know, in a timely manner. Any other? Uh, two more items. Uh, sorry, I got Warren. Uh, platform tennis work. Uh, tip of the cap to Coast of Catulus. We continue to work uh, towards uh, getting the two platform tennis courts constructed. Uh, so there are literally five parallel paths that we're following on legal documents um, to get uh, to the finish line. Um, so I'd be happy to board each of you with those five documents. If you'd like to come in tomorrow for about an hour and a half, it'd be great. Um, I'm just kidding. Um, but um, all the work is heading in the right direction. Um, so positive momentum there. Finally, the 2023-2027 strategic plan is in motion to put it out to Kyle Berg. Uh, we're working with the business unit leaders to begin the process of getting draft information to moving, and then we'll engage with the board according to the search. Update you on that. Thank you. Okay, well, that's a board leader. reports. Yeah. Like to go first. Okay, first, um, August. I know that everyone received a copy of the survey. For me, I would encourage people to review it. We had a lot of positive feedback, we had a lot of constructive feedback, we had a lot of thoughtful feedback. And so we're grateful to the community for that, and we're grateful to talk about putting it together. I will um, reach back out to Kristen Calter to invite her to um, talk about it as we did last year, and then she will incorporate some of the plans. Um, for people who are interested in um, serving as a park board commissioner, the deadline to respond back to the caucus is at the end of this month. Um, definitely an exciting time for the park district. So, um, you know, please consider serving. If you're continuing your service or serving anew, if you're interested. Um, so that's it from the caucus. For District 36, the big news was that they approved language last night for the referendum to be placed on the ballot, and that was through the unanimous vote. Um, they also presented their tentative budget of around $41 million um, for review. The other point to note is that they have identified a new council. It is not Robin Schwartz. Um, they have contracted with Freehab Oshik. So 
so and that's who we will likely be working with as we move down the process with whatever needs to happen with the property for the um, co island part of the referendum should it pass. And I think that those are two things. Thank you. Other liaison reports. Great, very none. We're on to remarks from visitors. Anybody like to speak? Hello, please. I'm Carrie Davidson. Second down. Please. Yep. Yes, please. So that we can record you and everybody at home can hear you too. Good evening. I am Carrie Davis, I'm the Executive Director of the One Economic Build Line for Chamber of Commerce, and I would like to invite you to come to the Farmer's Market this Saturday for the student session. Anytime you want, we'll pop up a tent table and share it for you. And we have over 1,500 to 2,000 people that travel through that market every Saturday. And that's a great way to capture a lot of, you know, people that are out and about. So anytime, just let me know, and we certainly invite you on in the Thank you. Any other remarks from visitors? All right, staff reports. Pat, do you have anything to report? Nope. No report. I'm going to report. Uh, no report. Thank you. Libby. No report. No report. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to add to my previous comments. I'll give you a report since I uh, made the treacherous walk now. Um, we are coming to the end of our uh, summer programming. Uh, beaches are still operational. However, we are closing down Maple Beach uh, due to staffing limitations. Um, I have explained to a couple of people this season, once we get to this time of year, we're in the middle ground between school starting earlier, beaches staying open later and trying to bridge the gap with the town. But we are very fortunate uh, and happy that we were able to keep Tower Road Beach open and operational fully staffed uh, at this point through the beginning of September and hopefully on through Labor Day weekend, which is our goal to start the season. Camp is finished up and another successful season of all of the Park District camps. Fall Fest is our next event uh, on the books, uh, a large scale event that is, uh, will be held at fields three and four. It'll be a wonderful experience. Um, we're hoping to be uh, very much on the scale or slightly larger than last year's events. And I, I want to thank all of our seasonal employees uh, from our beach attendants, our launch attendants, our managers, our lifeguards, camp directors, camp counselors, senior counselors, and counselors in training. We absolutely cannot do what we do every year without their, their support and and taking the time from their lives to, to help the partnership part programming. Uh, it's, it's essential, it's phenomenal, and it's just an incredible thing to see. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. I guess I do have a report. I just wanted to reference the memo in the back of the packet regarding some changes in our packet process. You know, recognizing the need for the board to have some information a little bit earlier you know, to have time to review it. So this is still kind of a working document you can see this week. Uh, didn't go as exactly as planned, but we're working on it. So the plan is that the, you would receive a draft packet on Friday to review and have the weekend to ruminate over. Um, on Monday, you would ask that you return any comments or changes or you know, if we've missed something, 
Um, and then we would like to have the packet to you on Monday and the official packet and have that posted again so the public have additional time to review it. Now, there are many Monday holidays, so that will be affected and the packet would then be posted on Tuesday and delivered if it's a Monday holiday. But for the most part, this is our plan and, and we hope it works for all of you and gives you that additional time that you need. So, anybody have any questions? have to hold firm on this uh, schedule. And if someone, if I, I don't want to speak for the board members, if yeah. I, you have to say, Dave, I'm sorry, you're too late. I'm like, okay, I'll wait for the next meeting. So I just would encourage you to be really firm on these days. Don't okay. comment.